Good morning. Yes, that's how we like to begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm H. Adam Harris, he, him, his, artistic and audience engagement associate here at South Coast Repertory. On behalf of festival co-directors Kim Martin Cotton and Andy Knight, welcome to the Playwrights panel of the 26th annual Pacific Playwrights Festival, PPF. South Coast Repertory was founded by Martin Benson and David Ems, and it has long been the home of new work. And under the leadership of Managing Director Paula Tomai and Artistic Director David Ivers, that commitment is robust. Via the lab at SCR, our new work development program, we've got over 50 commissions in process at this moment, multiple development workshops, and we're constantly reading play after play after play to capture the now, the present moment. Hopefully you've seen some of the incredible work in this year's festival. We offer our heartfelt thanks to our honorary producers and foundations for their generous support of this year's festival. And we thank each of you for joining us this morning, whether you're here in the theater or thanks to our partners at HowlRound, watching from home or the future when you watch this later. Um, we are glad you are here. Uh, today we chat with our PPF playwrights. We've got a total of 60 minutes for this panel. Uh, for the first chunk of our time together, I have some questions for them. Some of the questions will be specific to a few people. Some will be open to anyone to answer. And of course, any of them can pass if they choose to. Uh, after that, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Feel free to write down a question that comes to you as we chat. Um, first up, I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. Uh, I've also asked them to share uh, what person gave them the courage to be a writer, who inspired them to be a writer. So they'll do their introduction, name, tell you about what play, the play they're working on, and then answering this question of uh, who gave you the courage to be a writer? Um, hi, I'm Keiko Green. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I wrote, you are cordially invited to the end of the world. Woo! <laughs> Um, and I got, do I answer that now? Mm -hmm. I think that I, I went to like a really strange little Japanese Christian private school in Atlanta growing up and um, weirdly it was like my second grade teacher um, once told my mom like this girl knows how to tell a story and I think that he might have been telling her that I was a liar but <laughs> um, either way my mom was really proud and like kept telling me that as I was growing up so I, I, <laughs> I guess, that amazing second grade teacher. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Arya Shahi. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I wrote the Brothers play. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Um, I, I was a junior at, uh, I also went to a, a Japanese Christian, uh, <laughs> which was very, very strange. Uh, no, I, I was a junior at Carnegie Mellon studying acting, and I wrote a monologue for a, a voice project uh, about my grandfather, and after I performed it, the head of the playwriting program came up to me and said, uh, have you ever thought of being a writer? And I lied and I said no. <laughs> uh, and, then, uh, and then I realized uh, much later that I think I've, I've always kind of wanted to be a writer, so I started doing that later. Um, hello, my name is Reggie D. White. I use he, him pronouns. I wrote Fremont Avenue. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Um, and yeah, you know, similarly, I started my career as an actor, and I didn't think I had permission to do my own writing because I didn't go through eight years of grad school and undergrad and all of those things. Um, and two incredible playwrights who are, are dear friends of mine, um, Lauren Gunderson, who's obviously no stranger here or anywhere over, <laughs> in, around the country, um, and Cord Tuttle both uh, just wouldn't let me not believe that I had a story to tell, and they basically bullied me into writing, so um, I owe my deep, my deep gratitude to the both of them for seeing something in me that I was afraid to see in myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm Daniel Mace, I'm the composer and co-director for Fairy Tale Kids. I just see him. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Um, my answer to this is probably the, the most uh, obvious one is my mom and dad uh, never doubted for a second that I could do this ridiculous job that I now do. Um, and uh, they're, you know, I'm very grateful. And uh, I guess also the uh, free to be you and me movie was the other one. <laughs> like, I can do that. I can do anything. They, they told me I could project. <laughs> that's what brought me here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sean Hartley. I'm the lyricist for the Fairy Tale Kids. Boop, boop, boop.
fantasized being a writer because of people like Rodgers and Hammerstein. And then I would say specifically as a lyricist, what turned me on to the power of lyrics were uh, two writers who were starting to write pretty much around the same time, Susan Sondheim and Joni Mitchell. And Susan Sondheim sort of showed this incredible facility for all these techniques, but Joni Mitchell showed how personal Thank you. Um, I want to name that Anna Nagara of Meeting for Worship had to return home. Else Went is preparing for the reading of An Oxford Man that takes place after this. Craig Lucas couldn't join us for the festival due to prior conflicts. And Eleanor Burgess of Galilee 34 is feeling ill this morning. Uh, so I want to also give a shout out and thank you to them and thank you to these folks here. Woo -woo! Uh, so you uh, write uh, the world as it often does, like right now. Um, you know, it's sort of it feels um, there. There always feels like there's pressure. You know, Toni Morrison would say this is precisely the time artists go to work. But I'm just curious. You all have a very specific thing. You write for the theater. You create for the theater. Poets slim truth to meter and form. The visual artists capture light and the intangible in canvas. The musicians, to paraphrase James Baldwin, breathe their life force into song. And the dancers mold their bodies to instinct and possibility. So what exactly do you do? What is the... What is the job of the playwright, of the writer for theater? What do you feel called to do or stir up in your work? I'm just curious, like, why, why you think we need plays, y'all? Why do you do what you do? I, I will answer this question only because as you were giving that beautiful introduction, I was just like, what do we do? Yes! <laughs> but it was a thing um, one of my acting teachers said to me uh, about the role of theater and theater's job at its best is to model the requisite bravery required for the audiences to go out and live changed, better lives. Mm. So it's it's our our job to tell <laughs> brave stories about people making risks and getting things right and also getting things wrong so people can sit in a room as full as this and breathe together. I'm so happy we can be back in rooms like this and breathe together and experience together and have our paradigms cracked open a little bit to say like, oh, oh, maybe I should call my mom back, you know yeah. what I mean? Or, and, and this idea, too, that, that every play in and of itself is a two-act play, that, like, act one, however long the play is, is the experience here, but act two is, like, how you digest the play on your own on the car ride home or the subway ride home or a week later when a line still rings out to you, that it's about those little paradigm cracks that, that help people be a little braver. Yeah. Anybody else want to? Oh, oh, we got clappers. Okay, after every, we're going to have to, I see this, you all are ready. Anybody else want to speak to that, the why? Yeah, um, I, my mentor, um, one of my mentors is Naomi Izuka, and, and one thing that she said that I, I really carry into my writing is, um, like, every play has to be answering or, or, or posing some, a question that is basically like a giant philosophical shared anxiety hmm. and so i think that going into the plays being like what is the like the the great question that this play is asking that we can all kind of attach ourselves to i think what's interesting is that um it actually the more specific you get the more universal it becomes which is which was like a big surprise when i learned that um but but then it's like how can we bring that great philosophical anxiety to an audience and then and then like never forget the entertainment I, mm -hmm. I do think like it would be silly for us to pretend like you know that's not a part of it you know it's just like make sure they're people are having a fun time or leaving like wow I'm glad I spent an evening <laughs> off of my couch and at the theater so a uh, part of the why is connected to uh, sometimes people ask they're like what's the theme this year and I don't know that there's a theme although uh, my job is to answer questions when people ask me so if I were pushed I would be like connectivity but what I mean by that is that it's about connection through grief connection across distance time and space connection through generations and the connection between bodies and love and you know and, and I if I were forced to answer that's what I would say and I think it's connected I how much of your writing do you feel like is still in response to the isolation we experienced if any at all I mean I, I would assume all writing is in response to isolation of some kind mm -hmm. uh, I think we just had a, an intense period of isolation where everyone 
had to start investigating the narratives that are part of their lives. And we happened to have a toolkit ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was really inspired actually by the thoughtfulness and then the thoughtlessness of those around me uh, over the past couple of years. And uh, you know, I was just thinking about like the, the what do we do as playwrights question in connection to this. I don't know if it's as different as those other forms because I think a lot of people have different ways of synthesizing their lives. And one of the reasons I make plays is because I love the act of going to the theater and being an audience member. And I think we're just an underserved population. Uh, so why not make theater? I mean, who needs to make money? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no. I do. I don't <laughs> no, 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 guys, don't worry about it. The money will come. The money will, that's what they say. It comes. It'll come. It'll come. Uh, no, I just think it's 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 a it is truly a, not to get like on a soapbox or be a poet about it, but like it's a it's a dying it's a dying form in the sense that it is not as celebrated as I think it should be in the culture. It's never gonna die, it's never dying, it's not going away, but it's going away in the public consciousness. And that makes me very sad, mm -hmm. it makes me very sad. And I'm like, I don't I just don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So if I can be any part of like mm. stopping that from happening, I'm gonna dedicate a, a lot of my time to that. Great. Dang, you wanna see something cook in there? Um, well, I mean, I, I think that especially as AI becomes more and more of an issue, that there's going to be a premium put on uh, like engagement with real people and uh, as real people. And uh, I think that's something that the theater has that other art forms, a lot of other art forms don't. And um, yeah, I think it's 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 a place where the artist and the audience, you know, really meet up close and. Uh, and I think that there's definitely going to be more and more of a premium of those sorts of experiences as we move forward. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, we'll start with some individual questions. Reggie, you mentioned uh, that idea of a line that rings out to you, you know, a few years after the play is over. And so when I first read your play, the line that sticks with me is home is who you heal with when your dreams don't turn out the way you wanted them to. And it stuck with me uh, ever since I read it. And then I watched it and I heard it again. And I'm just so moved by it. How do you know that to be true? Um. I think I know it to be true because I have experienced it both in its fullness and in its lack, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's, that's, how you really, that's how you really test a hypothesis, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It, it's, it's all science, y'all. Um, but I am so deeply grateful for the chosen family I have collected over my adult life because they got to be the place that I got to heal sometimes from my nuclear family mm -hmm. um, and vice versa, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, that love is, love is an action, love is visceral, love is built, um, love is maintained, love is fostered, and that love looks different. And for ambitious people, um, the world is really cruel. Mm -hmm. um, for, for ambitious people of color, for ambitious queer people of color, the world is, is, is quite cruel. It, it, it convinces you that you're only allowed to, to want very little in the world. And, and so I'm so deeply grateful for the, the collection of people in my life that have been both given to me through genetics and that I have been blessed with through the outrageous fortune of, of making this my life's work that have been the places where I have been able to heal and will continue to heal. Thank you. Uh, Aria, this idea of love and action, um, the sort of same thing for me, one of the, my favorite images, and we talked a little bit about dads, uh, oh, yeah. just, about, just about dads and how dads are dads. Uh, but one of the things that I was just, it, it makes me so emotional, the idea that across distance and time and so many things that underneath this home is a treasure chest of, uh, of money and of safety and security that there is nothing that could prevent my love from sort of showing up for you. And I'm just like, what drew that image into the play? What made that image feel um, really sort of unnecessary to the story you were telling? Um, you know, speaking of specificity becomes universal. 
uh, I obviously, I already made a, I already made a money joke, right? <laughs> like money is a, a very big part of my consciousness because I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Uh, so that was just the manifestation of how my father actually shows his love. Mm -hmm. Uh, and because I, I tend to think of the world in images, I just think it's, uh, it's very interesting to na to navigate. And another thing that I happen to do is I happen to write about my real life a lot, which is I should probably stop because <laughs> the more people that pay attention, the scarier it gets. Um, but, but yeah, I think for me, there's always been an, there's always been an element of like, wait, I can only do what I do because there's money hmm. like under me, like that's not fair. Uh, and I really want to address it in a way that feels honest and both in, in the sense of my father and in the sense of like a lot of fathers that immigrated to this country and I want to honor that and respect what they did and also just be like wait something's wrong hmm. like just something's wrong like that like it's not the relationship that I want to have but it's the relationship that I do have and the man loves me more than I think anyone on the planet does right so like how do I <clears throat> how do I navigate that um, and I'm, I'm just gonna say one thing about this, which is, and then I'm gonna shut up. But uh, there's there's something interesting about like the way masculinity is changing mm -hmm. very very quickly, in that like in the '90s, this showmanship and this power, this stance of power, was the was the thing. And now, <clears throat> anyone that's been paying attention, I mean, this week this weekend was like an amazing weekend for the American theater because we are all here. But it was also an amazing weekend for rap music. <laughs> I, I was like, someone's oh, going to bring it come up. Come on, contemporary <laughs> events. Like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? Like, like, that is... Okay, the shots fired this weekend are insane. This is a, 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 some diss tracks between <laughs> no, a Kendrick Lamar and a Drake, I believe I, I guess, he is yes, addressing. Those are, the, those are the two gentlemen involved. <laughs> uh, uh, one gentleman and one person. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, but like, if you just <laughs> take a look at what they're saying about each other, it's all about mm -hmm. how they've failed as fathers. Like, what are we, what happened just, in the past 15 years of my life? We went to talking about how many guys you can kill and how entrepreneurial you can be, how much money you can make, to how shitty of a dad you are. That is growth America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why I put the safe in the place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I've been stumped. Um, <laughs> but what I'll do is I'll take it, and w w I heard lyrics, so I'm gonna come down here. Um, Daniel Sean, this week was a Pacific Playwrights Festival. You all have come down, you've joined us, and at various moments this weekend, uh, they, they said, listen, Sean and Dan need a piano right now. <laughs> They have got something, and we are like, okay, okay, we've got, okay, where's the piano? Who's in rehearsal? We need a piano, and we have raced you all to a piano. What is that about? What's that creative impulse? Responding to the diss track. <laughs> But talk to me about, like, you, uh, Prelude to a Kiss, the musical has been in development for a while. You've been creating for a while. There was a big push to opening night. You've got more work to do uh, when you go to Milwaukee. A musical takes a lot of work. But I'm just curious, like, what was the creative impulse? What do you feel when that thing is coming that you're like, we got to tinker it, we got to get it out? I'll tell you about that particular So Dan and I took the plane out together. And as we were sitting, waiting for the plane, uh, we are talking about this one song that we're just not totally satisfied with yet. Karen Ziemba is so terrific. And you, can, we, you can tell the song. So it's the, it's the entropy part of uh, the first song in Act Two. And Karen's part isn't sort of topping Jim's. And uh, I've been spending a lot of time thinking, well, you know, what can we do? And Dan, in the, the airport, said the suggestion for like, what it should be about, which I probably shouldn't say. Um, but <laughs> it was, yeah, all right, he said, the mom doesn't- We were looking for a way to bring the banjo back also. So he said, I don't like the banjo. You think, or it was, he's, you think I like the banjo? And I thought, oh, that's, 
what a great idea that's for the song. And so all the way out in the, uh, we were not sitting next to each other in the plane, but I was writing a draft of a lyric all the way out. He was in front of me and he leaned his seat all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> he kept pushing me back. Uh, but anyways, but we had this lyric, but we needed to, you know, the lyrics, are, it's always just a draft of the lyrics, and then we, we really need the music. So we needed to actually bop around at the piano and hear some chords and, and, and see how it would work out. And we're still a long way from figuring it out, but we, it was fresh off the, fresh out of the oven, so we needed to do something. How do you know when it's right? When we chatted about the sort of origin of Prelude to a Kiss, you talked about Not Me being the first song that really sort of you felt, oh, this is the spirit of what we want to do. I, I think that, I, I don't know if this is true for playwrights, because I'm not really a playwright. Um, but when I hear something that is right, it, it, it feels like a, a memory from the future. Mm. That's the only way, it's, you recognize it from the future. A memory from the future, woo! It, 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 Them snaps right there. Look at all these nods. And now it's manifested. That's yeah. And everyone's nodding. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that <laughs> does feel right. Kind of <laughs> I love it. A memory from the future. Wonderful. Uh, uh, entropy, Keiko, uh, um, you, uh, <laughs> there are play. The <laughs> yeah, the end. <laughs> yeah. You are cordially invited to the end of the world. Uh, there are plays about the environment, and there are plays about a life ending. What brought those two together for you? What way did you want to tell that story? Oh, okay. I'm going to, um, my husband's in the audience. I'm going to tell a slightly personal story. Um, okay, great. Um, I, I just got a nod that said that that was okay. Um, so right at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, my mother-in-law passed away, um, like March 6th, I think. And it was like right as, uh, in 2020, and it was right as people stopped flying in um, for funerals and um, and it was just a straight and we I was in grad school every, everything there got canceled and um, so we were living in my mother-in-law's house and we were watching the TV show The Leftovers mm. which I don't know if anyone has seen it's really good um, and I'm just gonna have to spoil one little moment which is that um, the, the Leftovers is the TV show about like like one day, 2% of the entire population on earth just disappears. And some people lose no one and some people lose like their whole families. And, um, and there was, Liv Tyler plays this one character <laughs> where um, her mom died the day before every, people were taken or disappeared or whatever. And she talks so much about how it felt like her grief was taken from her. And that's like kind of like her basic um, motivation for the whole series is just like her, her she's like rageful because the grief for her mother was was stolen um, and we were talking about wow we lost this woman who was so important and we're living in her home and packing things up and every time we were t you know everyone's just like of course yes that's very sad over zooms or whatever but it still felt like um but we're all actually kind of dealing with some grief right now, you know? Like everything's dead and it's really sad for all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, it, it felt like a little strange and, and we had this conversation of like, I asked like, do you feel like your grief has been taken from you? Um, and MJ said, no, um, it feels right that the world stopped when my mom died. Hmm. Um, and that sentence was so, um, it just kind of blew me away. Um, and I, I thought, we, yes, like, you know, we, we all have dealt with so much death, especially in the last few years, and we never talk about it. And like, how are all of us, you know, continuing to go on when, um, when, the, when our world ended? And for some reason, the theatricalization of that felt like, yes, this important person died, and what if literally the world died? Um, instead of metaphorically, and, and that was kind of the exercise for this play. Wow, thank you. Um, it was uh, also funny. Yes, of course. <laughs> 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 uh, um, uh, absolutely, the humor and the joy that uh, comes forward. So your play is an event in many ways. Uh, so we come to the theater and we experience an event. I'm just curious for you, uh, and I'll put this to you and to Reggie, um, what do you think theater needs more of right now? What do you think theater needs more of right now? What are you hungry for? 
Yeah, um, I, I think that one thing that I, um, I, I don't love sometimes, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm gonna get myself in trouble. But It's okay. But when we're in the theater and then something is said on stage and then like everyone snaps, my worry about moments like that is that we are just giving everyone exactly what they already wanted. And I think that um, the truth is all audience members actually have like no idea what the fuck they want. Mm. And if we, so I think our job is, is it okay to cuss? Is yes, it's okay. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I think our jobs is to give them something that like, oh, I didn't know I needed that, Yeah. actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a hard question to answer because I think, for me, the the act, the experience of of partaking in the theatrical ritual, is the ritual itself. And I think you know, to Keiko's point, people don't know what they need, so they come. <laughs> I'm not going to do the terrible uh, Nicole Kidman Australian accent, accent, but people come <laughs> to this place for magic. I'm not. Doing that. <laughs> I didn't warm up. You know what I mean? <laughs> My eyes are not quite. Um, but but we come to this place, you know, to, to your earlier point, to sort of the the act of theater going is a salve for the loneliness that the world makes us believe is necessary, mm. you know, and that, that that loneliness is not necessary, that loneliness is a choice, and we come to this place to to be surprised, we come to laugh, we come to think. I think the, the more to answer your question, to try to answer your question, I think that the thing theater needs more is more stories about people who dare to be wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to your point, yeah, there, there is a lot of, and, and I get certainly over the last eight years, there's been some real rage being felt <laughs> in the world because of decisions happening all over the place. But, but even when you think about that event in November, that rage is not new. There has been injustice. There has been, you know, <laughs> uh, wrongdoing in the world for a very long time and yes it is it's, i mean even as bad as far back as antigone you know what i mean there's the 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 act of ripping your clothes and, and grieving and kneeling in ashes is is not new but i think i think theater has a responsibility to tell people what it means to get something wrong and and to subvert expectations in a way to, to make people lean in and and also to say that like a, a quote from a, a brilliant dramaturg um, who's here, uh, Michael Walkup from Page 73, I think he said to me a very long time ago, is that people are better than their worst moments. And I think theater has a unique, resp- a unique ability to showcase people who do great things at their worst moments. Mm. Um, that theater has a responsibility to show that people can bounce back. And, and I think that's a, a, a beautiful way to subvert that because I think we do come looking for answers, but I think you know we should make the, we should make the test a little more complicated. You know what I mean? I love that. Uh, Ari, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just, wanted, um, just from a totally different perspective, uh, in terms of what do the theaters need, um, I just want to say that what the, I think theaters need subscribers more than anything. And, no, and, and I'm not joking about that because we have this climate now where people are being fed what what the producers think they want, and musicals are being done this way. We know you love Carol King, so we'll give you Carol King songs. Uh, and it's really uh, the, the subscription model where a group of people commit to a theater and say, whatever five plays you put on, mm. I'll come see them. Mm-hmm. That gives the theater the freedom to tell new stories. Uh, but on the individual, if every show has to make a profit, then you get people thinking, well, what will definitely people want to come? And that's what they already know. So just looking from the theater point of view, I think we need committed patrons who say, tell us five different stories, and whatever they are, whether we like them or not, we'll still come and we'll, we'll be part of the community. Thank you for that. It's a very different angle than I've heard on the subscription model, and I really appreciate it. I'm like, what a great reminder, you know? Com- commit to us and see what we give. It's a way to subvert the algorithm. Okay. Yeah. Fed all the stuff that they know we're going to like. Yeah. Everywhere we go. Yeah. I think this is the one place where I think we could all be surprised. Uh, Aria Dan, festival, go ahead. I'll just say this festival, people came not knowing uh, what the plays were, and I saw some amazing plays that I, I don't know that I would have bought the tickets to them mm-hmm. from the description. I would have said, I don't know what that is. I don't know if I'll like it. 
Aria, Sean, Daniel, uh, what's a piece of advice you've been given that has shaped you? It might have come in the form of a critique or a note. What's something that sort of shaped you? I have a couple notes for Aria. <laughs> 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 Will it shape Aria, though? Uh, Keiko is my primary shaper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just, I'm going to go back to the theme of my dad. Uh, my dad told me that anything was possible. And then I saw Spider-Man on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I realized he's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. The man is so right. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I genuinely actually, if, for those of you that know me, I actually, that, that says a lot. That I really genuinely believe anything is possible. Mm -hmm. um, I have not succumbed to cynicism even in, in, in the worst moments of just like bitter unfairness, I have to take a step back and ask myself, what can I do to make this better for the people that are hurting, even if that person is me? And I think, um, I actually do think my dad taught me that uh, in a big way. So yeah, anything's possible. Um, I, I remember hearing a piece of advice when I was younger that I took to heart, uh, be so good that people can't ignore you. And uh, I've carried that with me for a long time until the world beat that out of me. I realized that people's capacity for ignoring is pretty pretty large. So then my, then my, <laughs> my, my personal philosophy became uh, something that my, also my father told me, just never give up. And uh, that carried me the rest of the way. And, uh, that, but that eventually the world beat that out of me too. But, so now I, the, it, it, turned into what something my mom, my mom said, which is just everything's gonna be okay. And I, you sort of have to fundamentally believe that. I think we're all crazy optimists. Even everyone in this room, just for being here, I think you know, it's, everything's gonna be okay. Anything, Sean? Um, no. That's fine. <laughs> That's a-okay. Um, uh, one question to all of you, and then we're going to open it up to you all, so get your questions ready. We will run out of time, so when I finally say, oh, do you have a question, all your hands have to go up, okay? Uh, but one question to you all. You all don't create alone. Uh, you create with uh, dramaturgs, with directors. Uh, whenever I teach or whenever I'm working with people, I always offer up a set of guidelines. One of those guidelines is collaboration, and I used to work with these fifth graders, and I would always, you know, you have them, when you're offering up your rules, you say, what do you think this means? And over 14 years ago, a fifth grader told me that collaboration was working together, but like effectively. And I just thought that effectively part was incredible. And I've been saying it for 14 years. A fifth grader told me, said, you, you got to do it together, but you got to get the job done. Um, and then another fifth grader like tried to like top that. And they were like, gracious professionalism and I also was blown away I was like I was like okay cool and I told him for the rest of my life I'm gonna tell everybody that fifth graders told me that collaboration is gracious professionalism working together but like effectively and I'm just curious you have to work you've got to you write down a blueprint and then you have to share it with like a director with dramaturgs with actors what is collaboration for you in your process I love a dramatic pause after my question Uh, was from Craig Lucas, who was our third <laughs> collaborator. I feel hardly that I, I feel bad that I had to hang up. It. So working three of us together uh, oh, to yeah. say th things together, I, we all love telling a story. And, and what I would say collaboration is is contributing and then listening to other people's contribution and not, not needing that my contribution it needs to be the one that we stick with. We always sort of feel like whatever the best idea on the table is the one we go with. Sometimes we have to try a few of them before we know which one is the best, but it's, it's feeling comfortable enough to put yourself forward and take risks, but also understanding that uh, it doesn't mean you always get your way. That component is really curious to me. I'm just working with a lot of new playwrights or folks who are working on new work emerging. It's so hard to maintain your voice. Like, how do you, help, how do you what's the fine line between like, no, this is what it is, how do, I, how do I stay true to my voice, but also hear what this director dramaturg is trying to help me craft or create? For me, it's about the story. 
if we all commit to the story we're trying to tell, then we can judge what's how is the story being best told. Yeah. Whereas if it becomes an ego thing, then you need your own idea to be. Yeah. And, and it's not about telling the story anymore. Great. I I, I said on the first day um, in our room that my love language is rigor. And, and that the only way that I really know how to engage in a collaborative process is rigorously. So it's like, please, every question. Now the answer may be no, the answer may be a quiet stare, um, but, but, but putting the question in, in the room uh, allows us all to sort of ponder things together. I, I think there's, there's you know, you, you invoked him earlier, um, and he is absolutely the patron saint of my life, but something that James Baldwin said in his like, iconic 1971 conversation with Nikki Giovanni is, is that all art is, is, is just a response to a kind of human spark. And it's, as a, as a playwright, when you're sort of sitting alone in your room or your lovely Marriott Hotel at 3 a.m. in the morning just wondering like, how do you make this scene work or how, how, how does any of that work? That's, that's very lonely work and it's very scary and vulnerable to bring it to a room of strangers to be like, hello, does this resonate with you? Oh, the joke is terrible. Great, I'll cut it. It's fine. No thanks. It's, it's great. Um, but, but as long as you, as long as it feels like the spark, the initial spark is being responded to, then, then collaboration is, is beautiful. I think another thing that I, I get frustrated by, especially when people talk about theater is so much of conversation is about what they think a play should be or should have been or shouldn't have been, but I feel like discourse has gone away from what was, from a kind of curiosity about what the spark was, you know what I mean? And, and that's what I mean by my love language being rigor, is like, well, leaning in to invest, investigate, like, well, what was the spark? Like, what was the spark about your, your, your father and your brother? What was the spark about your, your mother-in-law? What was the spark about adapting this into a musical? And, and I think if we lean in and, we're, and we maintain curiosity about each other, about each other's inspiration, about each other's fears, then I think collaboration is, is, is magical. Anybody else? Go yeah, ahead. I feel like I, I, you know, the, the primary thrust of my career for the past 17 years is I'm a part of an ensemble called Pigpen Theater Company. And the seven of us met uh, uh, as actors in school. And then we started uh, writing together and we started performing plays together. And something I've learned, and I'm, I'm just going to offer this into the space because it's a very unique experience, I think. And, and I, I think something I've learned is that the story is important, but actually the work of our company is the work of being collaborators. Mm -hmm. Like, life is long. And I think if somehow we shift the American theater system to focus more on the long-term cultivation of artists that are allowed iteration, hmm. then you really have something special. Because what's more interesting to me than are we nailing this story is are we building an infrastructure so that when that creative spark happens, I have a team ready to go. Not only a team of like artists, but a team of friends and, and a team of people that I can be very vulnerable in front of. Uh, and so it was very funny. The Brothers play, first time I've actually written a show without those guys. Um, and so I was in the room this week and I was like, oh, whoa, I wonder, Obviously, I was thinking about the six of them constantly, but I also started thinking like, wait, I wonder if me and Canood were working on a show in 10 years, like wh how does this show change? And I can't answer that question. I just have to dedicate myself to, and I, so, sorry Canood if you're watching to pull you into this, <laughs> but we're working together for 10 years now, man. Uh, no, because there are, there are elements of like, I'm more interested in how people evolve and change and how they support each other as artists as they evolve and change than are we going to nail this show? Mm. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's, in, I think we're just too obsessed with the myth of like, of great artists. And, and what does that even mean? Right. Like, like, like I, you know, Sondheim, Shakespeare, like these, these names are, are, are mythic, but they didn't do it alone. Like it's, they just didn't do it alone. It, like it's impossible. So I think if we could uh, maybe think of collaboration as the goal, the long-term goal, then we become a model for how you, live your life rather than how you tell a specific story. Hmm. Excellent. 
Anything to add, Keiko? Yeah, I, I love writing in the room. Like, like there's a reason why we're not novelists, you know? We're, we're, we're like, in, inherently trying to collaborate just by writing theater at all. Um, and I think that there's, um, for me, there's just, like, nothing cooler than when you get a team together for a production and everybody, I mean, this is almost exactly what Sean was saying, but um, everybody not only knows the story that we have to tell, like, we understand the world of it. We understand, like, the feeling that we want the audience to leave with. Um, and I, I find that um, in spaces where... Um, on the first day of rehearsal, I'm, and we're like, hey, these are the designers, these are the cast, and then usually it just like disperses. The, the, the shows that we're like, hey, and when you see this designer, we're gonna invite the designers in like before the, the, the design run, and if you see them in the house during tech, go introduce yourself. Like those shows where pe there's a lot more like cross-contamination. <laughs> Maybe it's not what I meant, but um, <laughs> uh, I just think that the work is so so much more fun and um, clear and exciting, and it's and it's because of the collaboration. Excellent. All right, friends, we're going to come to you. Things you need to know. Thank you for those hands. But things you need to know about a conversation with me. We always talk about the four C's. A panel is very much like a post show. This is an opportunity for you to embrace your curiosity. Embracing your curiosity, raising your hand in the public forum requires courage, which I welcome, and I'm so proud of you for doing it. Just know that your curiosity might be met with challenge, but always with compassion. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, our job is to take care of these folks on stage and you. Sometimes there's some messy creative abrasion when we start asking questions about art, and I'm going to do my best to take care of everybody. Embrace your curiosity. We appreciate your courage. You may be met with challenge, but always with compassion. Hands, I will call on you, and we will move around the room. I'm going to start here. I'm going to go there, then I'll work my way back down. Starting here, yes. Uh, sorry, friend, I was right behind you. But I'll come, yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So the question is, for the plays that brought you here, what was a very difficult to crack, or has there been a great discovery? Let's maybe hear from two of you, two plays, two productions. So two plays, that's what I mean. Uh, the ending. Uh, like for me personally, uh, if for those of you that saw the reading, when we go into the sandbox, I, I just need to know that that is achieving what I, what I, what I think it's achieving. And, uh, and also, I think big, grand theatrical gestures like that can be a little showy and a little masturbatory for like the writer, frankly. Like, and, and I want to make sure that it's earned. So I worked a lot with my team on um, the ending changed. You know, the final image changed a couple times. And uh, the metaphor of the, the, the brothers when they're older versus when they're younger, I think, is still, is still something I'm chipping away at. What are you chipping away at? Yeah. I would say for us, it's that we have a completely naturalistic story that suddenly halfway through takes off into the realm of magic and mm -hmm. making sure that people go along on that journey with us without feeling like it's uh, disoriented. Right, without putting in all the shibboleths of magical, musical theater comedy, uh, like what happens when you have a, a much more naturalistic approach to it and still have that magic um, how do, you, how do you bring the audience along on that? How much should they know? How much do they know? Those, those sorts of questions. Great. Coming back here, yes. Uh, what surprised you about your own plays with having actors in the room? We'll give that to Reggie and Keiko. Yeah, um, my play is full of, it's supposed to just be full of like all types of people. Um, and originally this play was a commission and it was written for a specific company of actors actually. Um, that is not the actors that we saw in this reading. And, um, and as that play has transitioned <laughs> um, from um, that form to the new form that it's in, um, this was the first time I was bringing totally new artists into it. and. Um, what I thought, what was so neat was, um, in, it, it invites, I, I hope that my writing can invite actors to bring their whole personalities and their whole 
all of their uniqueness into it and just fill it and make it as um, human and flawed as possible. And what I found this week was they there are listen like they're amazing but but what i but what was so charming about um getting to see our first reading which was which had like a couple little technical difficulties um was just seeing um how when you when you give actors an opportunity to bring their whole selves and bring their whole personalities when the things fall apart a little bit there's something so um lovely about that actually and getting to see them like support each other and be there for each other and the flaws are actually what make us human and then the whole piece weirdly felt human um that was my experience with the actors yeah um you know I, I, the the play is uh also deeply personal and about my family and there's lots of like little easter eggs and, and inside jokes and things and i think the the thing that was so surprising was like each day of rehearsal, someone would be like, oh yeah, that happened to me too. Or like, how did you know that about me? And I was like, I didn't, I just met you, friend. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, <Actually. laughs> um, so, you know, the what was surprising was, was that by daring to be as specific and, and honest as possible, I was sort of like given the gift of, of unlocking mm -hmm. memories for other people. Um, and, and that was a, a real surprise and a real joy. And more people should buy Tupperware and not put their leftovers in cool whip containers. <laughs> All right, let me see some hands. Let me see some hands. I'm going to come here. I'm going to bounce there, and then we're going to get to you. All right? So I'm going with the scarf here. Scarf, and I, my scarf friend here. Then I'm coming here. Then I'm coming here. Then I'm coming to you. All right? Scarf friend, yes. Yeah, the vibration. So we got two questions here, one to Aria about in the interludes, there's that vibration. Can you tell us about that? And we'll just answer that one first. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the the primary metaphor there is that uh, it's the sound of, or it's, it's, it's the way that grief feels when grief mm. kind of interrupts a scene and all of a sudden you're somewhere else and you don't want to be there. Mm. Um, and then if I'm really like, really going for it, which I am, so, so I'm just gonna <laughs> say it. Um, it's the sound. It's the sound of the sands of time, because at the end, that's why the burst. You, 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 we're all we're in this hourglass with these brothers, and that's been the sound of sand the whole time. So I actually want people to think it's grief, and then to realize that no, it's the sand that's burying the little brother in the sandbox at the end. So I don't think we pulled that off quite yet, but but uh, <coughs> we're, uh, that's what I'm going for. Yeah. Anybody want to speak to the idea of young people theater? Uh, how do we keep the the engines of hope alive? Simple as that. You have to bring children to the theater. You have to invite your young nieces and nephews with them. People who haven't experienced it don't know it's great. So uh, you know, it's anyone who hasn't been to the theater. There are also a lot of communities that don't tend to go to the theater. So you know, invite them. That's it. Please. I was, I was just gonna say, I think there's like two things that I, I think about a lot, which is, one is obviously money. Um, m play tickets are so expensive. I, ha I wrote this play called Exotic Deadly, or the MSG play that was down at the Old Globe, and th we could, we were able to get some discounts and stuff, but like those tickets are like $90, you know? Um, and so to, you know, to get as many young people in as we got, I think was kind of a, 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 a magical miracle, you know? Um, and, and I think that that's just a huge part of it. And I, I, one more thing is like, I, like many of us, I started as an actor before uh, being a playwright. And when we would do student matinees, it was like almost never the coolest shows I was in. It would be like the most boring, and I'm not gonna list them because I don't wanna offend anyone. But it would be like, it's just like that's that's, that's what we teach them is like you go to the theater to get like taught something. Um, and and we almost never bring them in to see see themselves or just like have like a blast. And if we can just make sure like if there's a really fun play, if you're bringing someone to the theater for the first time, oh, just like it's so important that we give them the best time ever. It's always someone's first play, you know? Yeah, thank you. Um, one, one of the things, um, Hana Sharif, who's my boss at Arena Stage, so thank you for giving me a week off to be a playwright. <laughs> um, 
One of the things she says is that it's an institution's job to catalyze the shows we produce. Um, and, and I think it's the responsibility falls everywhere. I think it is on bringing folks in your community with you to see the shows. It is about making sure that our student matinees are, are not just vegetables because theater is more than just vegetables. Um, it is vegetables sometimes, but also it's cake. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but it is, it's, as a person who works in an institution, it, it, I take that responsibility on the institution to be in meaningful relationship with community. It's not just about saying, oh, you can, you can come here for $25. Like I think so for so long because theater used to be held as this sort of great um, modicum of sociocultural literacy for a generation that you know used to be able to have a lot of disposable income, which is not the case anymore. Um, theater was an incoming call business, and you know it was like yes, you had your subscription to the symphony and the or you know and to the theater. That's not that's not the case anymore, and our institution has really failed to evolve the way that we are in the, the way that we're meaningfully engaged with community, and it's on the institutions to be in relationship with the people. Our, our job is to be of service to our community. We are a lighthouse. We're not a restaurant. We're not a clothing store. So we need to go out and shine the light. And if there are dark corners, because there are dark corners in every community, we need to make sure that everyone knows what we're doing. Tony Kate Bambara says the job is the, of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. We have to make the revolution irresistible. Excellent. Come in here. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. The question is about playing games on stage, going to grad school, studying the interaction of games on stage. Reggie's play, there's a game of spades being played, which is about chance. Is it in, what, what's the spirit there? What, how are you drawing those connective tissues between the game of chance and also you wrote the play for those specific moments? I'm a control freak. There we so. go. <laughs> There's no chance here. <laughs> Some people who have healthier relationships to trust can do what they choose. <laughs> um, yeah, no, for, for me, the, the device of spades in, in all three acts was, was not just about the act of playing the game, but it was also this sort of like seed of, of sometimes good things get passed down generationally, not just trauma. <laughs> um, sometimes it's good stuff too. Um, and so it was really about using the device of spades to tell a story about how these three generations of black men learned to relate to each other. And, um, you know, they can play whatever they like, <laughs> but if the stage direction says that person won the book, they got to take all the cards, you know what I mean? So they have to act like they won, <laughs> even if they didn't. Uh, I, 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 would be, I would be curious in another, another project to, to like put a live game on stage, but I'm just, I'm too competitive, so I know myself, and I would be trying to win the game, and I would forget my lines, and I just like, I don't want, I don't want to be cruel to the actors like that. And there's just something so beautiful about the win, you're right? And you so you like, I mean? the win is so powerful that it's like, if you've not lived a win, particularly spades, but any game, if you've not really lived a win over an elder, you know, it just like, it don't, it just rings differently. So you gotta, you gotta capture that at the right time. It's actually, it's like, <laughs> oh, this is so humiliating. Um, it's like a production of Chorus Line, where you're like, you know the people who get in at the end, but you're like, oh wait, shit, am I gonna be the person? <laughs> and you're like standing there at the line, and you're like sweating and breathing, and they're like, and they don't call your name, and you're like, what the fuck? I can't <laughs> really high today. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm like, let's take the chance out of it. All right, we're coming down here, friend here, yes? Uh huh.
the question is about vulnerability. What does it um, what does it mean to write so vulnerably about what you do? Uh, uh, how do you protect yourself? How do you protect the people that you're writing about? Because they know that you're writing about them, but we don't. So what's the? How do you sort of walk that fine line of vulnerability? We'll name that we're gonna go five minutes over because we started five minutes late. Go ahead. Um, I, I do think that when I'm when I'm like teaching playwriting too, I often encourage playwriting students because um, what happens eventually is they're like writing something that happened to them, and then at a certain point, I'm giving them like a note about pace or something or flow and they're like oh but that's what she said and it's I'm just like I don't care it's boring <laughs> and so there's kind of a little bit of a, I, I'm much kinder than that but but there but there is a point where you actually have to disconnect your life you know this play is like a real you know it's 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 inspired by something and also obviously totally different because it's a wild play with like toads and rats but um B but um, I, I think that there, even the plays that I write that are like extremely close to, to me or, or my mom or something, though you have to be able to um, serve at a certain point, treat it like it's Shakespeare or something, you know, like, I, I, and you need the actors to be able to do that and you need to think, be able to think about it in terms of story structure a little bit and in terms of like, oh, is, am I, am I like tracking this moment? Maybe I have to seed this a little earlier, even that, that even though in real life it was like a total shock, Correct. like though you just have to be able to do that. And in that, I think, um, comes a great respect for, I think as long as you, um, treat everyone with great respect. I also do ask if, if, you know, personally, if I'm writing about something that is from our, our little family, then I, I do ask for permission and just, um, I just make sure that I'm honoring and not um, roasting. Thanks. Anybody else want to speak to that? Yeah, I um, also do the same thing. Like if, if, if I'm, I'm writing one, a one for one or what seems like a one for one, I'll have peop the people that it's about read is when people get access to, like you guys are the first audience, right? So I'm learning so much this weekend. But when something gets at, like blown up and you have a much wider audience, there is a moment of reckoning that is very much happening in my life right now where I'm like, oh, people are gonna make assumptions and I can't control that. So there's an element of like, yes, of course I care, but I, I mean, this is the hardest part about being like a person who writes is you have to believe that you have the right to write. Like someone has to say this stuff and I'm sorry that happens to be me in this moment but I promise you it's bigger than us. I wouldn't be doing it if it was just about us. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Just like, try, I, somebody has to do this. Somebody has to reflect back what's happening. So that's how I kind of justify it. <laughs> you know? the, only tight, the only tiny thing I'll say about that is that I, I think it's important to remember the difference between therapy and fiction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that like, mm -hmm. please go to therapy. Where's the camera? Please <laughs> go to therapy. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I write about personal things that I, I I'm deeply engaged in a healing process of, and I think it's really important, like to Keiko's point, to remember the difference between trying to write an autobiography and being a good dramatist, and and you need some distance. You know what I mean to say, like, okay, this thing happened, but like, that's actually not really that's not the most interesting part of this story. I'm gonna let I'm gonna allow myself to be a playwright for a little bit and let these things be inspired by people that I love, and I think. It has to be rooted in love and respect, um, but that you have to give yourself the permission to, to write fiction. All right. Well, I'm just gonna jump on. Well, sorry, because this is very interesting. I do think, the, uh, to agree with you, the, the fact that a lot of artists are starting to think that they're journalists is very scary to me, because that's not the same thing. We're not, we're not journalists. That's not what we're here to do. We're not here to report the news. We're not here to report the facts. We're here to actually tell a story, right? And, that, and that's why I believe what you said is, uh, insanely true. You must always be looking after the narrative, right? Yes. Because it's our job as artists to make something palatable, right? And oftentimes the news is not because it's actually crazy, right? It's actually not palatable. And so you come to art to start trying to synthesize and figure it out. That's all I'm gonna say. Great, come in here. Uh, Spider-Man the musical, yes. Yeah. 
You know, I am so happy that you asked that because that was going to be my final question to you. So I, I we're going to take your question and we're going to uh, just walk down the line. I'm just really curious, and this will be our final question as we close out here. Um, you know, sh what we, you just mentioned there, we're constantly exploring the tricky intersection of truth, producible, classic, but urgent, funny, but also about something, diverse stories, but inclusive to all gazes, queer, but understanding. What do you urge each other and play rights to do what's your advice on navigating the complexity of commercial producible but also true and we'll just walk down the line here and close us out yeah I I think this answers the question um, I th I think that um you know I, I actually I, to be totally transparent with you I haven't actually met that many I, I'm not in the place yet where like I've talked to like a commercial producer and they were just like, I loved the show, you know, it's like, I, and, and then the artistic directors I talked to have almost always been like, here are some thoughts, but like, honestly, it's you. Um, and so I, I haven't been into the place yet where I've been really talked out of some decisions. Um, and so, but what I have done, and I, I wonder if it is just like, I will always listen, you know, I always will listen to other people's um, thoughts. I won't, uh, now I think this is just reps, like being in it long enough where you start to know w whether that's right for you or not. Mm -hmm. But I do think m even more than that is like the spirit of trying. I think that um, all of us in the rehearsal room sometimes get into a little bit of a headspace of like, well, it's supposed to be like this, or the actor is like, but I, d I, I feel it's supposed to be this. And if we, is the more we just get into like constant bravery of trying and failing. Um, and if, you know, I, I, when I talk to an AD, I'm like, Let, we'll try it in the room. But if it doesn't work, we're we are going to still keep it cut. Like, I, I think the spirit of trying goes a really long way. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, I, I struggle with that um, because I have worked in the commercial theater and. Um, 12 it, Tony nominations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's. Uh, the truth is, you know, I don't expect the Brothers play to be on Broadway, right? Like, that's not why I wrote it. Um, but I would also like to have some shows on Broadway because that would be nice. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, in the ideal world, those two things make sense, and they're in communication with each other. And I think you get the the you know the the one show every once in a while that like somehow synthesizes those two worlds. But I but I uh, I don't know. I think I think it's I think that is the responsibility of the artist to kind of figure out what they want to be and who they want to be and how they want to engage with the world. Because I don't think the world's going to answer that question. I think those are actually different forces. Are, those are very different forces at play. Okay. Um, yeah, I think about the Nina Simone quote that you know an artist's job is to respond to the time. And then I also think about the story about Alice Childress, who Trouble in Mind was actually supposed to be the first black played premiere on Broadway. And the, pro the producers wanted her to change the ending. And because she didn't, it didn't premiere on Broadway in her lifetime. But eventually, it made its way because it was speaking to a time. And so I think if, if, if I remain committed and the people who I, I love around me remain committed to telling the absolute truth, it'll speak to who it speaks to. And you know, I, I can't be in control of that. It's just my job to tell the truth and close the keyboard when I'm done. Great. Um, musicals are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as South Coast rep, I'm sure has learned. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Another piano. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. But, but, it, it, but it's true. It takes an enormous amount of not just people, but money to, to produce musicals. And, um, you know, there's so much gratitude for when South Coast Rep decides that they're going to develop new musicals. That's such a commitment. And the fact that they have a relationship with the community and the community is so generous to allow this to take place. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that because, because of what, what we do really requires uh, outside money, um, you learn quickly uh, how to, to, how your voice can fit into that sort of enterprise. There's a, there's a there, you know, we all have like the Venn diagram where like we overlap with certain things and, and, uh, I think it's just, you know, you have you have other avenues to get out other types of work that you want to get out, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, 
my, my relationship with that question is just one of gratitude for the opportunity, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would just say that the, the producer or the producers are, are really a, another creative partner in the process. Yes. And there are good matches and, and bad matches. And mm. uh, a, a good match with a producer is somebody who shares a vision with you and whose opinion you can trust. Uh, so that if uh, you know, you're working towards the same goal, and, and a bad match would be somebody who wants to change what you're doing because they're afraid. Uh, it, it's, it's never really, never works out very well when people try to guess what the audience is going to like or try to change it to make it more appealing. Uh, it's much better if everybody sort of, we know what we want to do, we know what we want to say, and thank God for producers who help you to reach people. But the producer obviously is responsible for thinking how large a house for this, mm -hmm. what kind of space, what community, you know, is there a community built to support this? Is this going to open in a place where the right audience can get to the theater? Um, we, we both work in, in non-profit theaters, and we're thinking about that all the time. So I don't see them at all as an enemy, I just think of it as uh, they're, they're at the table, and the better that you work with as a, as a group, the better your product will be. Thank you. I never take for granted the opportunity for us to be in community and in space with one another. A really good conversation is one that you don't want to end, but you know must end. Uh, and so I think we are close to that moment. I want to say thank you all for joining us for this festival. A round of applause for these incredible artists. South Coast Repertory remains committed to new work, to artists who are creating new work, who are drafting the present moment to help us to the future. We encourage you uh, to make your way to an Oxford man. You got a little bit of a break. We'll see you over there. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, guys.